Immigrant Names and Manifest Searches, Part 1, by Joel Weintraub. This is a revised YouTube video. The original online talk was deleted. It's gone. I found additional resources and immigrant records on the topic, so many that I decided to remake the video into a three-part video series. This is Part 1. Part 1 topics include a certificate of arrivals, you'll find out what those are, name change reasons, preliminary petition form, names used and reasons for, manifest searches, and then we'll start looking at various name variations. Part 1 will look at first and middle name variations. Part 2, well you can read what Part 2 will cover. And by the time I actually record part two, I might have changed a little bit. And here are part three topics. So each of those will be a separate video. Let's do a summary of naturalization in the 1920s. What was it like? So here you are. You just got off the boat. And you are legal residents. Two years later, you submit your declaration of intention. Then another three years, at least three years, goes by, and what do you submit? Now, a lot of you might say, I will submit my petition. But that's not quite accurate. Instead, there was a preliminary form that was needed to get a bunch of diff things together so that you could then go and submit your petition. So from that preliminary form, and with the declaration, you would send it to the District Director of Naturalization, at least that form. We'll talk about one that's a little earlier. And then the director would send it on to the arrival port to check the manifest. Only if your ship came after June 29th of 1906. This will tell you a little bit about why that date is important. And so those immigration clerks at that port will then make sure that your name is on the manifest and you are that person that's there. And then they will issue a certificate of arrival. Certificate of arrival. That certificate of arrival is going to go to the naturalization court. They're also going to see the preliminary form. You're going to bring in the declaration and the witnesses. And then, only then, can you then submit and finalize your petition. So these three videos that I'm going to have, the emphasis will be on the preliminary form, exactly what it looks like and how it was used, and whether they were successful or not in finding you on the manifest. Let's look at an early certificate of arrival request, kind of like a do-it-yourself. This is from the 19, early 1920s. And you can see on the top, it says that it's a request for a certificate of arrival for use of aliens arriving after this date uh, it was a very important uh, uh, act, a, a law that went into effect that tended to uh, document more the immigration naturalization process. And you're given this form, and you're supposed to, as you see on the bottom, came to this country after this date. Uh, please obtain for me a certificate showing my arrival in the United States and forward it to the clerk that is going to do my naturalization. And along with that, there is a fax for petition for naturalization. You would give enough information that so someone could actually uh, find you on a ship manifest. You can see it on part four. They want to know when you arrived, the port, the date, and even what your accommodations were like. Now, if you're ship came before June 29, 1906. You can see on the top, you got this form, just the facts for a petition for naturalization. You notice, and you might have not, uh, noticed it in the previous one, 
that after you filled out the form, you would mail it in. This one you would go, you would send directly to the court. There's no, there's no search going to be done for the, uh, uh, for the certificate uh, of arrival. However, it will ask, you can see in number four, how you got to the country. So, remember, in this case, the applicant, in this particular case you're looking at, the applicant arrived in 1903. No one checked the accuracy of his arrival information. So keep an open mind about any ship arrival information on naturalization forms if they came before June 29, 1906, because no one verified that. Let's look at Antonio Wilkatis. He's born in 1891 in Lithuania, came to the U.S. in 1910. And in 1922, he submitted that form that I just showed you. Throughout these talks, uh, I'm going to emphasize uh, a little bit more some of the immigrants over others, and those I will give this sort of title page to. So here is his facts for Petition for Naturalization. He, uh, let's see, he arrived in 1910. Looks pretty good. Look, it's all nice and typed and, and neat, and he submits it. And uh, unfortunately, he gets this letter back which says, Dear Sir, examination of the immigration records at the port of which you state you entered fails to show a record of your arrival on the vessel and on the day given. You may be mistaken in the information given on the enclosed request. Therefore, it is suggested that you consult with your family or friends who came over with you and thus try to learn the facts of your arrival. And it goes on. So how did Antoni not Antona, and Tony solved this problem. Well, it was lucky that he had a prepaid ticket number. The ticket was actually bought in the United States for his passage. And so he was able to uh, have someone write to the International Mercantile Marine Lines. This was kind of like a clearinghouse. You can see all the, the lines involved. And they were able to tell him exactly what ship uh, what port, what date he would have arrived on. Also, immigrants often hired uh, lawyers, and the lawyer also chimed in and uh, said to the Bureau of Naturalization, greeting, after your department returned the enclosed request for a certificate of arrival to the applicant, it was referred to me for the purpose of strengthening out the difficulty that seemed to stand in the way of the issuance of a certificate, with the result that I have had the matter traced in such manner as to discover that the applicant was mistaken in naming New York as the port of his arrival, as well as being mistaken in the name of the ship. So his memory after arrival twelve years before, he was wrong for both the port and the ship name. And he finally did get his certificate of arrival. He actually came through the port of Philadelphia, and the vessel was the Haverford, not what he originally had said. Now, in the middle of the 1920s, Form 2214 superseded that, that forms that I've been, been showing you, and it was called a preliminary form for petition for naturalization. It turned out that I actually happened to have one partially filled form in my collection. It's from the 1920s. It's about 204 millimeters by 267 millimeters. And if we look at the top, it says to the applicant, it's very important that this form be carefully and completely filled in. Then take it or mail it and your first paper to the naturalization examiner's address be below. And then that box on the upper left, we will see exactly how that is used. So it didn't matter when your ship came, they would decide once they got this form whether to send it on to the port for uh, figuring out whether you, you came on that ship or not, or to uh, just give it to the naturalization court. So Giuseppe Filoso He's born in 1889 in Italy. He arrived in 1920. 
He had some problems with this preliminary form, it's obvious. And so here is this form. In fact, they didn't even touch the box in the upper left because they indicated to him that he had to send his first papers. And a lot of people are really confused because first papers are also called the Declaration of Intention. And so there's a certain amount of ambiguity. These forms were really you know, somewhat ambiguous, actually. And he was really upset. He said, and I'll show you a, a translation of this if I can. Come on, let me see it. There it is. Dear sir, dear sir, I have done all I could, but it is in vain. It seems that I cannot satisfy you. Which first papers do you mean? I don't know which one you mean, unless it would be the half citizen papers, whatever that is. If that is what you want, I have got the papers, because the first time I tried to fill the form, I send it to you, and when you answered back, you did not send it back to me. If that is the paper you mean, you had better see if you can find it in your office. I don't know whether he actually became a citizen or not. It was a four-page form, this 2214. Look at all the things that it asked, and it asked a lot of questions that also duplicated what was on the ship manifest. So not only could they find your name on the manifest, but they could compare the answers to make sure they were looking at the same person. So next I'm going to go through the application process um, and replies, etc., using actual documents, not necessarily from the same person. So you would send this 2214 form and your declaration to the district director. And if everything looked all right initially, you would get a, uh, a letter back saying your declaration of intention is returned to you herewith to be retained until you are notified. Don't do anything until you are notified to call the office of the clerk of court to file your petition for naturalization. You should then present it to the clerk to be made a part of your petition for naturalization. The immigration authorities have been requested through this 2214 form to issue a certificate of your arrival, depending on, you know, when your ship came. When the certificate is received here, appropriate advice will be sent to you. So this is the sort of, uh, you know, uh, speed up and wait uh, sort of letter. You're not supposed to do anything. On the other hand, <clears throat> for Salvatore Pilla, born 1902, arrived 1920, he ran into some problems here uh, on this form. And he got this letter, similar to the one you just saw earlier. Dear sir, no record of your arrival in the U.S. has been found because the informa information you gave on the attached form was not correct or else it was not complete. And so they're going to give him another new form to fill in. And actually, they don't really tell you, tell the immigrant why they were uh, not, not uh, finding him. After you have written the requested information on the new form, mail it and also the attached attached original application to this office. So I have both the original and this update, and usually what they do is they mark up uh, the original if they find new information. If you have not done so before, be sure to enclose your declaration of intention for his paper. Also mail your passport if you have it, and it was not needed uh, before 1918. Anyone could pr pretty much come into the U.S. without papers. Ship labels, Baggage checks or other papers that may help in finding the record of your arrival, they will be returned to you. So now what's his problem? What's his particular problem? You can see he gets back his uh, 2214 form. On the upper left, uh, they try to locate him and they say unable to verify. If we look at the bottom, uh, we find out he, he says that he can't, comes into New York on the La Lorraine, La Lorraine. So he goes through his paperwork, and some of these records are really nice because there's lots of correspondence there. And here he says, and, and it, it seems to me it was so nicely written and uh, with penmanship that someone else did this for him. He says, Dear sir, I enclose you will find my application for my naturalization paper 
as you requested me to do, I have talked the matter over with my family and friends, and the information I had given you is correct as near as I can remember. It's all same thing. I'm going to give you the same thing back. As for sending you my passport, baggage check, or other papers that may help in finding the record of my arrival in the U.S., I cannot remember what I did with them. Very truly, very truly yours, etc. Well, he was kind of lucky, actually, because when he submitted this, you see the box in the upper left just has the, uh, uh, the name of the clerk, the check marks, they check everything off. He actually didn't come on the La Lorraine. So one of these immigrant uh, clerks, once they, they saw this guy was really serious, he came on the ship, maybe they re redoubled their efforts. And if they knew something about the ship names that were coming to their port, they would realize that there might be some confusion. Now today, uh, with some really uh, good databases online, including the Steve Morse website, he has a way of finding uh, names of ships arriving in in uh, New York Harbor. And if you see here, there's the La Lorraine. But look down here, there was another ship in that group called the La Terrain. And actually, Salvador was on the La Terrain. He made a mistake. You know, I would guess that a ship only has its name on the outside of the ship. And so uh, it's difficult for the uh, immigrants to remember what ship they were on. So th this form is, the immigrant wouldn't see this form. It goes from the naturalization service to the court of record. And so they enclose the form 2214, both of them, if there was an update, the certificate of arrival, they give the name of the uh, immigrant, uh, and they tell that they're going to advise the immigrant that these documents are now at the court, that they indicated they were doing the naturalization, and, uh, some more information. And at the same time, at the same time, they send out a, uh, a letter to the immigrant saying, you're advised today that we did this mailing. You may now take your first paper and your witnesses to the office of said clerk of court and file your petition for naturalization. And you must at that time deliver to the clerk of court your first paper, which must not be less than two years old, nor more than seven years old. The, decl the declaration of intention is only good for seven years. And if you miss out the time limit, you're going to have to start the process all over again. So you might wonder, what happens if they're unable to verify? I mean, how many times can you do this? It was interesting that I found one, um, one file uh, in which the, uh, uh, the director of naturalization sent it to the court, not to the individual, and said, Dear sir, to the court, replying to your letter of 19th instant and returning here with the declaration of intention which they had and preliminary forms for petition, more forms for petition for naturalization, your intention is invited to the fact that on two occasions, two previous occasions, a search of the card indices of arrivals at this board for the years 1906 and 1907 failed to disclose a record of this person's arrival. The immigration authorities have already had the date of arrival as claimed by him. And there was nothing new here. And it would be useless to again ask that further search be made based upon this information. And there's a suggestion that because his mother accompanied him to this country, it's possible she may have some papers in her possession, presumably if she's still alive, referring to the arrival so that she can furnish better information. So they're quite aware uh, of this possibility, but they give some hints. So where online are these 2014 forms? I mean, there's so many naturalizations, there should be lots of them. And it turns out that's not true. It was really hard to find online samples of these forms. And I'm going to show you in the show notes where to find them. Some of them are, are not available online. Some of them are only available at family history centers. Only a few of them are online. And what this these three videos are based on are mainly on New Orleans, which had 
over something like 670 of these forms. Connecticut had a large number online. West Virginia did as well. Uh, and there's smattering of some of the others. Now, there may be a hint as to why we don't see too many of these. I found this uh, on a website online, and it's, uh, it's about Mahoning County, Ohio. And there's a historical note. The collection contains preliminary natural, naturalization petition forms, called second, I'm not sure those are second papers. The petition is the second paper in a sense, for Mahoning County, Ohio. These forms were submitted to the District Naturalization Office along with immigrants' initial applications for naturalization, for verification of information such as arrival dates and residence before nat- residence, length of residence before naturalization could proceed. Now, the important thing here is, these forms were to be destroyed when the final naturalization certificate was completed. This group of records was not destroyed, was preserved by a clerk who passed them on to some person who donated them. And where are these Ohio records? They're at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and they're not online. That's probably the reason why we don't see more of these. What happened was, 2214 forms were then replaced by something called an N-400 form. And here is uh, uh, another version of that later on from the 1960s that I have uh, in my uh, file. It turns out, uh, you can see here, it it pretty much has the same information as you would expect. However, you know, the, the 2214 has no real way of determining whether you are the person on that form except the matching of the information. Here, in 1960s, you were going to submit photographs, you were going to submit fingerprints, uh, and uh, some other aspects as well. So gotten to be a lot more, quote, efficient maybe, though if you go through the process, you may not think so. And here about this this date, uh, about date of arrival, if the date of your arrival in the United States was before June 30th, 1906, you should submit with this application any documents you may have to show that you have been living in the United States since before that date, such as family Bible, entries, deeds, leases, wills, life insurance policies, bank books, employment records, receipts, and school records. So, so far, what I showed you of problems with immigration forms is not involving names, but immigrant names and spellings can gum up the process. So a problem with verifying verifying some immigrant arrivals, both for the immigration clerks and present-day researchers, is changed immigrant names. Jewish Gen has 10 myths, and myth two is spelling of surnames is important, and They say, no, no, that's a myth. Spelling is irrelevant in genealogy. Names are not not irrelevant, but spelling is. As the consistent spelling of names is a 20th century invention and obsession. Names were almost never spelled in a standard way in earlier records. For example, it's not unusual for the same person's name to be spelled Myerson, Myerson, Magison, etc. They're all the same name. Transliteration from one language to another creates infinite spelling variances. E.g., and we're going we're gonna to use this, so pay attention, you're going to be quizzed on this. E.g., there is no H sound in the Russian Cyrillic alphabet. So Jewish names such as Hirsch might become Gersh, utilizing the G sound instead. In fact, we'll go even farther than that. Warren Blatt has a uh, slideshow on Jewish gen on given names, Jewish given names. And he says, quote, names like Hirsch and Hinda become Gersh and Ginda or Kirsch and Kinda. In some Lithuanian and Ukrainian regions, the initial H sound tended to be dropped entirely. So Hirsch became Ersh 
and Hinda might appear as Inda. Okay, got that down? Now, one of the things that uh, I did when I saw uh, a problem that the immigrant clerks couldn't find, uh, the, uh, the manifest, is I tried to find it myself. And there is a website called stevemorse.org, the gold forms, uh, that you can do searches like this. Uh, the trick is to put the minimum information down, not the maximum. The less you enter, the better you will be. And here's how Steve compensates for spelling variations. You can use just the first couple letters of the first and last name. And people who change names or spellings often kept the, 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 the letters of the first and last names, the first ones, or sounds like, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll, we'll show you how this works later, or perhaps in other parts of this video. The underlying name database was transcribed by 12,000 Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints volunteers as part of the 1992 Statue of Liberty Centennial Project. It was done from 1993 to 2000 from photocopies, photocopies of the film Manifest. The Manifest themselves were destroyed in the late 1940s. And so you, you, if you look at these films, some of the films have some exposures on the film of poor quality and may be unreadable. This is the best possible copy. And they got photocopies of that. And uh, I think scanning devices today are so much better uh, in terms of bringing out the resolution of these. So mistakes were made, and we'll, we'll find out some of them as we go through this, these talks. So why do people change their names? What, what sorts of name changes would you expect? Well, translations and transliterations, shortening of the, of the family name, married name, typographical errors, why, why do people change names? Like learning a new language, fitting into a new culture, finding and earning a living, dealing with discrimination and prejudice, reducing pronunciation problems with people they meet. And all this is leading to, quote, Americanization of names. American, uh, uh, whoops, Americanization of names. Looking at the next slide. I'm in uh, slide view. So how did people change their name? Wasn't it hard? Well, there's a book on Ellis Island by Mar Barry Marino. He says, because there were so few identification documents used in those days, which is true, this is before 1918, one could go by any name one chose. Or well, one chose. And then there's a book by uh, uh, Kristen, where is she? Kristen Firmiglish called a Rosenberg by any other name, who looked at name changes of Jewish population in New York and said that New York state law does not require that individuals change their names formally at all. So long as you use the name consistently for a period of time, it is considered to be your own name, so long as you are not trying to defraud anyone. And there's people who still believe that that names were changed at Ellis Island by immigration authorities, that the immigrants had no choice. The, the authorities said, here's your name. And I have a whole YouTube video on what really happened at Ellis Island. I, with all the um, records I looked at for this, uh, I had, didn't see a single one who said that their name were arbitrarily given to them at Ellis Island. And here is the YouTube address. But I'm going to put all these on the show notes, all these reference uh, addresses. The 2214 has a name section, that form. It's up to the immigrant or his or her helper to interpret the questions. This is the start of 2214. So it says, I desire to petition for naturalization. It shows the court following information is furnished, you may arrange for my preliminary examination. They're looking at residence requirements, etc. And that the necessary papers may be sent to the clerk of court. Part of the necessary papers, of course, would be the certificate of arrival. So at first it says, my full, true, and correct name is, 
Now, this is interesting. Is that the name you're using in the United States, or is that the name you use in the old country? And this person said, I have never used another name. If you had used another name, write the name down there. And then it says, I used that name because. Use what name? So if you answered, I have never used another name, and they say, I use that name, which in this case would be Kaloji or, or Te or well, whatever. I'm not great at, at uh, uh, pronouncing names, as you can see. You would, you would wonder about that. And therefore, you would get these funny responses. I have not used another name because it's my family name. Of course it's my name. It was given me by my parents. It is my own. Or this one in which he, he says that he changed his name a little bit uh, from a Z to a C. It, I, I think this is cute. It distinguished me from many named Sibylish. Isn't that what our name does? It distinguishes ourselves. Although I see a lot of Joel Weintraub's now uh, on the internet. Or this one. Now you notice the change of color. The previous ones, that really nice orange color came from the New Orleans uh, uh, records. These have come from, most of these records are on family search. So Niall says, that is my father's name. Of course, that's my name. Or it was always my name, given by my parents. And Wasso, I, I actually tracked him down. I was curious, did he ever did change his name? And he died in 1957, and, and on the official forms, he was still using Wasso as his first name. So that section, I use that name because this line gives us some insight into the reasons that immigrants changed the way they wanted to be called if they filled it in. But a caveat, line 26 of the form asked, did you yourself fill out this form? If not, who filled out this form for you? And many immigrants had help with the form and probably the wording of the answers that were used. So there tend to be a little bit of boilerplating here of, uh, of answers. Now I tried to take all the records and try to uh, kind of pigeonhole them into categories. And the, um, uh, the, net, the remainder of these uh, uh, YouTube videos, this is the end of part one and part two and part three, are going to try and pigeonhole people, but their records may fall un under more than one category. Let's go back to this name part again. And continue, Be below this, I used that name because there was uh, a question about the name on my steamship ticket was. And again, that was ambiguous because if you never use another name, then what name are they looking for? And this person put down the name of their ship. And you can see on below it, another person uh, responded, don't recall the name of the company, but the vessel was the Manila. So there's a certain amount of ambiguity there, and you'll see problems like that. Of course, what they wanted was to find out, especially the immigrant uh, clerks at the port of arrival, what you actually had on your manifest. The name on the steamship company ticket should be identical to the name on the manifest. Now, some people said, I don't have a ticket in there. I don't have a name. So this person put down, no ticket. I was 18 months old. I don't know if they needed a ticket or not then. Uh, that particular record, the person arrived in 1893, so they didn't have to confirm the ship name. Or the bottom one, person says, cross with mother at age two months. I'll show you another person that I wanted to show you. Slip this in because this is important. Her name is Sadie Katz Opakowski. And here's a form, a form for this petition. You notice in the upper left, that's a petition number, but there's nothing filled into that box. And if we come down here and look, we find out she says, I, my, I, have, I have none. The name of my same steamship ticket was none. And the reason was, if you look down below, she was born in Louisiana. She's not an immigrant. But what happened in the early... Um, 1900s is 
that if a U.S. woman citizen married a foreigner, they lost their citizenship. And finally, in the 1920s, the late 1920s, people were addressing that, that era. But, you know, even looking at this, there's some interesting information here. Because uh, Sadie says, this is my maiden name, Katz. And she says, this is the maiden name of my mother. And sometimes maiden names are difficult to find in genealogy. She filled out a, a form, uh, an index card, and it looked like they had them actually sign their own name. It was a requirement, actually, of naturalization that the immigrant had to be able to sign their own name in English. So she signs that. She even signs Sadie in a different way. And in terms of, of the Declaration of Intention, it's, she didn't need one. It says, Act of September 22, 1922. She had to do an oath, etc., no certificate of arrival, um, etc. So my sample for these uh, uh, immigrant records, I looked through about 900 preliminary forms, more than once, more than twice in some cases. I saved for possible use those that indicated they used another name and the reasons for it, and those who the clerks were unable to verify. I also saved records that had correspondence, or made a point that I wanted to emphasize. And I didn't get them all. I skipped over some that I thought, oh, maybe I would never use that. There are more such records that I did get that I included, uh, then, then I included in this video series. So I got a lot of records here. You're already going to see, well, I'm not even sure how many records you're going to see, maybe something like 140. So let's look at uh, one category, which is mandatory name changes. And uh, for most records, I'll only show you the crop name section of the form. Here we have two people with pretty much identical, I use the name because, and they say, I am a member of a religious community. I am, a, I am now a member of a religious community. So here are women coming in who became sisters. And uh, so there's information about them. Here we have another reason uh, it was my maiden name. Uh, maiden names in genealogy, as I say, are hard to, to research. So this is kind of neat. Uh, here we have on the top a person whose name is, is Fanny. Uh, she's Ashley uh, Thega Zella. Uh, and you can see her maiden name is Wilk. And uh, her mother's maiden name uh, is, uh, you can see it there. And then Louisa also goes through the same situation. So if the if if the if you can find these these forms, you can ask the court if they still have them uh, associated with the naturalization. Uh, it would really really be something. So let's turn to first name translations, and I'll tell you that most name variations, uh, spelling, etc., were for their first names, not their family names. First names are, are pretty fluid, uh, even today, in terms of what people want to be called. But family names are another matter. It takes time, and it takes uh, really pressure on immigrants to change their name, to fit in to, the, to their new country. Let's look at Morris Le Lewin, or Levin. It's not clear in terms of the handwriting. He was uh, 15 years old when he came to the United States. Uh, he was born in 1895 in Russia, and the preliminary form is in 1928. So time has passed 18 years. Now, you can see it looks like a mess here. You look in the upper left, in that box, they're unable to verify. They've actually looked at Rush, R-U-S, and they looked at Estonia uh, to see if there were two uh, ships named that way. For some reason, New Orleans tended to cross out information. They didn't block it out. But here you see that this person whose name was, or at least he said his name on the ticket, was Moisha, probably Levin. It was my Russian name for Morris Lewin, or Levin. So he went from Moshe to Morris. But they couldn't find his match. 
So let's take a look at this. If we go down here, you can see he says, uh, the name of the ship on which I came was, he really doesn't know. He says Estonia or Russia, and someone put down Burma, B-I-R-M-A, which is the name of a ship. And they looked through those, and they could not find this person. Could not find this person. So they obviously asked for um, a, a second chance, which uh, I don't have uh, necessarily, I don't think. Let's see? He did go get naturalized. He didn't have any problems. So somehow the additional information uh, enabled them to find the manifest. And there his name is on the top, Morris Levin. Now, I tried to find him, tried to find his ship using the Steve Morse one-step site, the gold form. And I couldn't find him. I could not find him. When you're doing something like this, and if you're an immigration clerk as well, uh, you, you, you were given the name of his mother. Uh, I might have passed over that quickly, but his mother was Zalat, Z-L-A-T-E, and uh, he came with his mother. So I was able, with the uh, gold form, to say, I'm looking for somebody whose first name starts with Z. His last name starts, her last name starts with L-E. She came in 1910. I don't read. I'm not going to put down uh, the date. I'm not going to put down anything else. And I get a whole bunch of people who uh, meet that that characteristic. And I see, hey, look, there's somebody who came on the Pretoria on December 13th, 1910. And that, and then I go into the ship manifest on the top of the Pretoria, and there is a lot. And there is a 14-year-old, but he's not Moshe. He's Mordecai. So he couldn't even remember the name he came in, even though he now has used Morris. And if you look on the left, you'll see an SI in front of their list name. And they were then stamped, admitted. They went to special inquiry. That was no fun. Uh, they could have been deported. Uh, but I think about something like a third of the people uh, might be deported from special inquiry. Uh, the, the SI sheet is a separate uh, list that you can sometimes see, uh, depending upon the uh, the date that the ship came in. And you can see under the that's at the bottom that they came under LPC, which is an over you know it's, it's just a dumping area called uh, likely public charge. You can number of ways uh, they can decide, hey, you're not going to make it here. But in fact, they did make it and they came through. You also notice that one of Mordecai's uh, siblings has numbers there, 7154. That is a search for certificate of arrival. Starting in the late 1920s, immigration clerks were told that if they did a search, that they should put down the numbers of, of the certificate, the searches, and the date. It was especially prevalent in 30s and 40s that they followed that rule. The argument was that they they wanted to avoid um, a fraud, that a line on the manifest could be used by more than two people to get naturalization. Lots of fraud involved in uh, the naturalization process, especially after there were restrictions because of quotas, etc., so that is the CA search number. And if you want, if you're interested in understanding and interpreting such manifest annotations, this is what you want to go to. This is uh, an essay by Marion Smith at Jewish Gen with the assistance of uh, three people. And I'll show the, this website and others in the show notes, tell you uh, what, those, what those numbers mean. Let's look at another one. These are all in depth. Eventually, we're going to look at shorter uh, names, why you used an alternate name. Here's an interesting one. It could be put into other categories. Here we have Sam Helfman. He, he was born in 1900. He comes in 20 years later, has a preliminary form. And you can see in the upper left, they can't find him. Unable to verify, they looked at the Gothland. And he says 
that I changed my name because my first name was Shamul, and it's Sam in English. So, Sam Helfman, and he says that the name of my steamship ticket was Shamul Helfman. Okay, and uh, do I show the bottom? Yes, I do. I want to show you something. We're going to be using this later. Uh, he's a shoe salesman in, in New Orleans, and the person he's going to, which should be in the manifest too, is a brother in Detroit, Michigan. So somehow he ends up in New Orleans. However, using the form information that, that's here, I can't find Sam using the Morse Gold form. I tried all sorts of ways of trying to find him. And so what's the last thing you would you would do? I mean, it's really frustrating. Here's the ship. He says he's on. He's actually on that ship. I have all this information. I can't find him. So, and I know, I know he was naturalized because he has a card, Samuel Helfman. He writes his name down. He originally was to, uh, had a declaration in uh, Detroit, Michigan, before he, he came to New Orleans. So I bit the bullet, and I looked line for line through this ship manifest. And there are probably 1,500 people here. And up jumps, pops out to me. I'm really good at this. Up jumps out in the manifest a Shamul Elfman. Aha! And he's going to a brother. And it doesn't say a brother. It should, though, actually. He's going to a person in Detroit, Michigan. Aha! And there he is. Remember what I said about Eastern European names that start with an H? I wonder if the clerks, immigration clerks, were smart enough to know about that. Now remember, I don't have his follow-up. Somehow or other, New Orleans only um, scanned the, the, the initial, the original papers. I did some more record searching for Sam. It turned into a lesson of why one shouldn't trust documents where you don't know the, the source or the veracity of the information. So here is a 1930 census when I was trying desperately to find him on the manifest, so this might help. And there is Samuel Helfman. He's living with, if you go down to the bottom, the president of the shoe business. And he's a clerk in that shoe store. But look what they did as in the center for where he was born and where his parents were born, and it's the the the, uh, the record says Louisiana. Nope, 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 nope. So here now are a bunch of of uh, shorter uh, things about how people change their first name. Gaetano is Tony. It's American for Gaetano. Giochino is Jake. Jacina is Jake, because it's the English for those. Jacino is the Italian name for Jake. And look, uh, the middle one says, I've not used another name. It's just a different spelling. You know, it's just the uh, same name. Sam Damari, born 1903 in Italy, arrived 1921. Unable to verify, upper left. But the important thing here is he changes his name from Sebastiano de Maria to Sam de Mari, the name I am using now as a translation in American language. Uh, and they say in the upper left, no index book, no manifest, can't figure it out. What's, what's going on here? And the reason is, even though I don't have uh, the, the second uh, form of this, that Wrong, wrong port. He didn't come in through New York. He came in through Boston. Boston. Luigi becomes Louis, Italian name. I use that name, Italian name. Pietro becomes Peter because of English spelling. You know, notice sometimes they're using the, uh, the, the, as the full, true, and correct name, the old country name. In some cases, they're using the American name, the U.S. name. 
Francisco becomes Frank, Italian spelling. Italians were the number one group that went through Ellis Island. Francisco Antonio becomes Frank Anthony. Notice they're not touching their last names. Giuseppe Antonio becomes Joseph Anthony. Giuseppe is Joe. Italian spelling. Carmen becomes Carl. It was translated from the Jewish language. Wilhelm becomes William. Old country name. Harold, H-A-R-A-L-D, Andreas, becomes Harold, O-L-D, Andrew. And this person was sensitive enough to decide that that's a different name. And it says it is so spoken in Norway. Nuchim becomes Norman. It is the name, it is the same name, but pronounced different. I have a great uncle called Nuchim who came in, who became Nathan. With the bottom one, Ben Zion, Merlion becomes Benson Merlin. It is the English for the above. Georgie becomes George. Joseph Gal becomes Joseph, G-A-L-L. -L. I have no use another name. I have never used another name. Georgie is George. Here is uh, Alice, Alejandro becomes Alexander, Spanish name. Here we have Salvador becomes Sam. Never use another name. It is my real name, which is the same as Sam. Janice becomes John. Now, I don't know about this bottom one. Uh, this person said, I've not used another name. Now, in this particular situation, uh, it could be who, who prepaid the ticket for it. Uh, there's no explanation for Batista. Here we have Laredo becomes Lawrence. It is pronounced in English as Lawrence. Uh, probably wanted to say spelled. Here is one in which we have Francisco Jose becomes Francis Joseph. It is equivalent to my Spanish name. Here we have Pietro becomes Pete. Here we have Panagiotis is also another Pete. Both of them say, I have never used, I have not used another name. Here we have Ivan becomes John, English translation. And uh, Gustav becomes August because I thought this to be the right translation for Gustav. Here G Giaspina becomes Josephine. It was the American translation of it. Antonio becomes Tony as a translation in American language. Here we have a person whose name is Stanislav Gunther. He becomes Stanley. You notice in the upper left that there are problems with finding him, unable to verify. There's not much information I have on him. However, I can see down here that he put down the wrong ship and the wrong date. So he did go through Philadelphia, but he's off by a couple of months in terms of the arrival of the ship and the name of it. Right there. And there is his goal. Let's see here. Janus becomes John. He says the word Janus stands for John, uh, for better expression. Ju Jula becomes Julius. That is my name in the Hungarian language. All right, so you get an idea that not only did they change the spelling of the name, but a lot of them decided, I didn't change my name. It's my name. So some of the people use nicknames, and I'll show you some miscellaneous reasons here as we start wrapping up this uh, first part. Here we have somebody whose name is Gaspi Gaspano, 
who becomes Oscar, because that's a nickname assumed from childhood. People might wonder, where did Oscar come from? Did the clerks at Ellis Island say to him, your name is Oscar? And actually remember that the uh, the uh, myth about name changes is always that I've seen about the uh, the family name, the surname, never the, never the first name. Well, here we have somebody who is uh, Johann, becomes John because they called me that since infancy. Another one whose first name is Constantinos becomes Gust there, and known by it in Greece. Here we have an abbreviation, Bernardo de Ben, uh, someone who changed two S's to uh, an X. And then we have people who are using middle names. So here we have Gomer Eugene Joseph Maurice Vekemans becomes Maurice Vekemans, uh, abbreviation. Or Thomas Henry Rushton, I guess, becomes Harry. I was always called Harry for short, but he also didn't like his first name. Uh, another long one, George Georges Henri René Grandjean becomes René Grandjean for short. Uh, another one with Michael is the middle name. He uses that instead of Ignatius in terms of that. So this is another one of my JDW talks. Remember that there's going to be a part two and a part three for this. Hope you go through the other parts as well.